Um, so I'm going to talk, as Jimmy mentioned, about ultrafast optical measurements of spin polarization <coughs> in semiconductors, and kind of um, also then also give you an overview of some of the recent results we've had um, in doing these measurements. So um, before I explain either the technique or the results, I'll give you a little bit of a motivation for why we want to study electron spins in semiconductors. And for me, really, I'm, I'm a physicist by training. I, I like the interesting physics. So we're talking about the preparation and study of coherent states, so it has natural implications and relationship with quantum information. Um, the spin physics in semiconductors is really fascinating. It involves scattering and spin-dependent band structure and is only something that we have been able to probe relatively recently with uh, spin-dependent measurement techniques. And um, the spins in materials also interact with nuclear spins, which I'll talk a little bit about, as well as impurities, magnetic impurities, and holes. And I'll also talk about um, spin momentum coupling and, and spin transport. So we do measurements where we apply electric fields to samples and we see how spins behave under the apl application of these electric fields. And um, semiconductors are also a highly tunable environment, so we can change um, all sorts of different variables and see how they affect the electron spins. Um, so variables including the carrier density, mobility, confinement, strain, and apply electric fields or change the density of dopants. And so I'll talk a little bit about how those affect uh, spins in semiconductors as well. So um, this is my slide explaining why one should care or be interested in spintronics. So this is um, the giant magnetoresistance effect uh, was discovered in 1988. And in this effect, um, it was shown that spin polarized currents can actually help you uh, measure the magnetization of me metallic layers. So in this technique, um, it's basically you can make a sandwich of um, ma a magnetic material and non-magnetic metal and then a, another a ferromagnetic material and then dependent depending on the relative orientations of the magnetization of the magnetic layers, you can measure a difference in resistance. So this is neat because you can just do a, tr a simple transport measurement and detect the magnetization of, of a layer. And so um, as opposed to um, what you had to do earlier with your hard drive read head, which is detect mechanically the force that was mechanically exerted on um, a fixed magnetic layer. And so this allows you to do a measurement that's both a lot more sensitive, and so you could make your magnetic bit smaller. And so it was quickly picked up commercial, commercially, uh, where commercial GMR <coughs> field sensors were available pretty uh, shortly after the discovery of this effect. And now this is a technology that's used in all current hard drive read heads. And of course, uh, Furt and Grunberg were awarded the 2007 Nobel Prize uh, for their discovery of giant magnetoresistance. So why are we interested in semiconductors? That work was done in metals. So um, one thing you can do in semiconductors that you can't as easily do in metals is logic. And so this is an example of a, a prototypical proposed logic device where again you have a spin dependent injector, spin selective injector and a spin selective detector. And what is different about this device as opposed to the GMR device is that you can have uh, a gate here and with that gate, um, you can uh, change the spin precession in this channel so that you can either uh, make the electron spins be aligned or anti-aligned with your detector or something in between. And so um, this is an analog to an electro-optic modulator. And uh, the reason we can do this in semiconductors is due to a few different um, things. So one is that you can have long spin coherence times in semiconductors, and you can also have voltage tunable spin precession through spin orbit effects, uh, which I'll uh, introduce and, and talk about how, how we can measure those. And so um, the results of my talk will kind of focus on a few of these different aspects that are introduced in this schematic here. So I'll talk about how we were able to do ultrafast optical measurements to probe this uh, electron spin transport through a semiconductor channel and um, how it moves in response to electric fields. I'll also talk about how we can measure the spin orbit fields associated with that um, electron motion. And I'll also talk about um, how we can sensitively measure the electron G factor in addition to those internal fields. And then finally, I'll end by talking about another technique of measuring um, electron spin dynamics. Okay, so how do we actually do these measurements or what allows us to do these measurements? So um, what 
enables us to do these measurements are the spin-dependent sl optical selection rules. And so I'm talking to a condensed matter slash AMO crowd here, so you're uh, probably familiar with this. Um, but it turns out that in the materials that I study, uh, such as gallium arsenide, there are spin-dependent optical selection rules. And that means there's a relationship between the polarization of light um, and the um, electron transitions that are allowed in the material. So sigma plus is, uh, let's say, right circularly polarized light. And so if I uh, shine uh, right circularly polarized light and I make it um, resonant with this transition from the valence band to the uh, conduction band, I can get a three to one uh, ratio of uh, spin minus a half in the conduction band as opposed to spin plus one half. So this allows me to prepare spin polarized uh, electrons with roughly 50% efficiency. Um, so the first measurements of um, electron spins were done um, by looking at the circular polarization of the luminescence. So similarly, if you know, if you can detect uh, the circularly polarized luminescence, if you have uh, more electrons in the minus one half state than the plus one half state, you'll also end up with some uh, circularly polarized emission. And uh, that's what I just said. So um, our measurements are a little bit different. We use a pump probe technique. And what this really gives us is excellent temporal resolution. So imagine, um, or you've probably all seen a picture of a bullet going through an apple. So that was taken with strobe photography, where either you could use a very fast mechanical shutter, or you could use a, a strobe light that's on for a very short amount of time, and it just measures what happens during that instant of time. So by using ultra-fast pulses, we can do the same thing of just sampling what happened in our sample at that instant of time. So we use uh, 100 femtosecond or a few picosecond pulses, and uh, we use uh, first a circularly polarized pump beam to produce electron spin polarization. And in our measurements, we typically start off with an N-doped, electron-doped sample. So there are already uh, some electrons occupying the conduction band. Um, the reason for that is, um, so we now uh, do our spin-dependent um, optical excitation. And then um, there were some holes left behind in the valence band, and there'll be uh, recombination from the bottom of the conduction band. But because we started off with electrons in the conduction band, even after that recombination, we'll still be left with some spin polarization. And this is great because we can measure spin dynamics that span much longer than the radiative life, uh, lifetime in these materials. Um, the other thing that will happen, of course, is if we have a magnetic field, there's a spin splitting, and um, we'll observe that the spins process in the plane that's perpendicular to the magnet. And so then we follow that pump pulse with an optical probe pulse, and it's uh, delayed by some time delay that we control with a mechanical delay line so that it arrives at the sample at a different time than the pump. And if we vary that time delay, we can map out um, both the initial excitation of the spin polarization and then its oscillation, precession, and decay. Okay, so this is a picture of, of what it looks like in our lab. Um, we have the mechanical delay line here. It's just a cube corner retroreflector that's um, controlled, that's uh, moved along by this uh, stepper motor. And then uh, this is our electromagnet. And then our sample sits uh, on the cold finger of this uh, flow cryostat. And um, this is what our, our data, typical data looks like. Um, we see these uh, oscillations and then, of course, the, the decay. And if you change the magnetic fields, you change that spin splitting and you change the spin precession frequency. And so we can fit this data to an exponentially decaying cosine and extract both information about the uh, G factor and also the spin lifetime. All right, so um, then moving along. Um, so I mentioned about how we're interested in seeing what happens to spin backets as they are uh, moved as they move and as they drift in electric fields. And so we can just vary this, change this measurement technique a little bit so that we now add a, a scanning mirror to our setup so that we can pump at one location of the sample and then change where we probe relative to that pump beam. So uh, now you can see that we could create our spin packet over here, apply an electric field, and a, as the electrons in this channel drift, um, the spin polarized ones move along with them and then we can measure what happens to them. So if we do this type of experiment, um, I didn't label it here, but these are for different volta uh, voltages. As you increase the voltage, you can see that the spin packet moves. So this is a good check that what we're measuring are uh, con conduction electrons and not localized electron spins. 
Um, the other interesting thing that happens is when we do this measurement, we can, sim we can also simultaneously measure the electron spin precession. And what we see is that those spins behave as if there's an internal magnetic field acting on them. And we can also plot what that, the magnitude of that internal field is. So the natural question then, okay, that before getting to that, I guess I'll, I'll just show how we can measure both the magnitude and direction of that internal field. So again, our data um, as a function of time and magnetic field is just this decaying <coughs> cosine. And um, so let's do a different type of experiment where instead of changing the time delay, we do our measurements at a fixed time delay and instead change the applied magnetic field. So if we do those measurements with an applied electric field, we see that we measure a cosine as you'd expect. That's where the um, magnetic field dependence lives um, in this expression. Um, but an interesting thing is that this, uh, the, we see that this, uh, the maximum of this cosine is not at zero applied magnetic field, but it's shifted a, a little bit away from zero um, external field. And so that tells us that there's an internal magnetic field that we have to cancel in order to get to the actual zero. And we can prove that this is the case by doing experiments where we change the magnitude of this electric field. And I'll show you that it increases linearly with the applied electric field. We can also change the geometry so that we apply the electric field in, along the same direction as the external field. And it turns out in this geometry, uh, for some uh, conditions, the internal field will be perpendicular. So again, we end up with something that's symmetric about zero, but the center peak is diminished because we can never cancel out entirely the magnetic fields acting on the electron spins. But when we get to a large enough external field, they don't matter. Yes? Yes, so bound electron spins can influence the measurements because they'll be, um, they'll, they'll basically swap. They'll, they'll, um, electrons can become bound and then back into the conduction band. And exotons, so we typically measure things at, um, at time scales that are longer than the exciton lifetime in our, in our measurements. Yeah, but those are both good questions. What's going on with in the, the Yakut panel where it's not uh, sinusoidal and, and how, how is that different? Right, so the reason it's not sinusoidal is because we're, when we do our measurements, we're using a mode locked laser that produces pulses every 13 nanoseconds. And so what happens, I have this nice inset to show that actually, is that we're exciting spin polarization every 13 nanoseconds. And so there are multiple, um, I guess, spin signals. And um, when, uh, when we're at these special magnetic fields where, we're, uh, where they have a constructive interference, we get an enhancement. So it, in effect, you could think about it a couple of ways. It's, yeah, so it's this enhancement because we're at a maximum, it's constructive interference or we have um, a bunch of cosines that we're summing up and they produce these Lorentzian peaks. Um, so one thing that happens when we apply the electric field is we spread those out because they, were, they arrived at the sample at different times so they have drifted different distances. And so we, we only measure uh, the signal from the, from, the, um, from the last pulse that we're interested in. Um, but when we have uh, no electric field, they all overlap with each other. Great, okay. Other questions? This is a good point because um, this is the end of the, you know, these are how we do the measurements and then I'll jump into um, some of the results. Okay. <coughs> so um, what are these internal fields? Where do they come from? So um, these are uh, spin orbit fields. So they um, arise from an effect of special relativity where electric fields um, behave as magnetic fields. And in, in semiconductor crystals, you can break them down into a couple of different categories depending on where they come from. Um, so they're related to the breaking of spatial inversion symmetry, um, which breaks Kramer's degeneracy. And um, the, the, the linear spin orbit fields typically have two um, like dependencies. Uh, so this one on the right is the, the Rashba field. It's more isotropic in that no matter which direction you're looking at, the spin orbit field is always pointing to your right. Um, on the other hand, uh, there's also the Dresselhaus field um, or the biaxial strain spin orbit field, uh, which you can see is a little bit more interesting. Uh, so there are some directions where it's perpendicular to momentum and some directions where it's along the direction of momentum. 
Um, and in our samples, we typically have both of these together. So we have to break up um, our, um, into both of these terms. And so we can fit to determine um, what they are. So I'll show you, um, I guess, an example to convince you that we have these uh, spin orbit fields and we can measure them. So this is uh, showing uh, in different colors, uh, different uh, applied electric fields. And you can see that in this data, we have both a parallel uh, spin orbit field. We have both a spin orbit field that's parallel to the applied uh, magnetic field, which causes the shift, um, and also a spin orbit field that's perpendicular to the magnetic field, which causes the center peak to look different from all the other peaks. And we actually fit the data to get what those two are. And so because we know, um, so we know we're applying our uh, electric field along this crystallographic direction, um, and in that direction, we can then separate. So the Rashba field is always perpendicular to the momentum, and the Dresselhaus field is uh, parallel with the momentum. So we can then separate what each of these are. And um, if we do measurements as a function of uh, the applied voltage, you can see they increase linearly. And then we fit that slope uh, to um, get a coefficient uh, that we call beta. So um, now that we have a spin splitting, you might wonder what we can do with it. So one of the things is we can um, have uh, electron spin precession that depends on the electric field. Um, the, the other thing interesting that happens is that we can observe an electrically generated spin polarization. And we think it's related to the spin orbit field, but we're not sure exactly how. Um, so I, I guess as a primer to that, um, I wanted to put this slide up to introduce both this current-induced spin polarization and the spin Hall effect and show you um, how they differ. So it, it was discovered, I think, around 2004, 2005, that when you apply uh, an electric field, you run a current through a semiconductor sample, you can produce both a spin polarization at the edges of the sample and also a spin polarization throughout the semiconductor channel. And so you can understand the spin polarization at the edges. It's produced by the spin Hall effect. So there's a transverse spin current to the applied current. And it, it, uh, the spins can't go any far farther when they get to the edges. And so they accumulate at the edges of the sample. And we can observe that in an optical measurement. Um, the electrically, and I'd argue that the spin Hall effect is relatively well understood. Um, on, a, on the other hand, there's also this um, bulk electrically generated spin polarization throughout the channel, and, and, and I'd argue that its mechanism and how it depends on sample parameters is, is less clear. And so if you wanted to use this for something, like to make it, it larger, um, I really don't know how to do it. Um, and so I'd like to understand it better so that we can use it if we are interested in using it. And one of the challenges is that um, measurements have been done over the past few years, but these measurements have not shown a clear trend. So in terms of where it comes from, um, so this electrically generated spin polarization um, was predicted a long time ago. And it's believed to, um, I mean, one way you could consider it happening is you have this uh, spin splitting. And so it lifts the degeneracy between spin up and spin down. So you might expect some equilibrium spin polarization. And in that case, you would expect that as you made the spin splitting larger, you should also increase the size of your spin polarization. Um, and um, experiments are often harder than theory, and so they take a lot longer um, to realize. So this was uh, maybe 30 years after the, the theory was done um, that a couple of groups uh, measured this electrically generated spin polarization. And also because it's harder, most of these measurements were just done on a few samples, and no clear trend was observed. And in fact, something surprising was observed in that um, there were measurements also done on wide band gap materials that are also composed of lighter elements, so they should have smaller spin orbit coupling. Um, but the magnitude of the spin polarization observed in these measurements seemed comparable to the measurements in gallium arsenide, um, despite the fact um, that in some of those measurements, um, the internal magnetic field that I was talking about, the spin orbit field, was not observed. So that's also mysterious. So how is this spin orbit field related to this electrically generated spin polarization? So actually, in Yui Kato's paper, he measured a number of samples. And he carefully characterized both this uh, spin orbit field coefficient and also the electrical spin generation efficiency. So 
unsurprisingly, as you increase the magnitude of the electric field, you get a larger effect, and it seems to be about linear. And so you can fit a slope to that, and um, we call that the electrical spin generation efficiency. And since the table is kind of hard to look at, I've taken the liberty of plotting those values of the, this measured uh, spin splitting coefficient and this electrical spin generation efficiency. And it isn't really clear whether there is a trend. Um, maybe it's not even clear that there should be a trend. Um, and so this was one of the questions that, that we wanted to um, look into. So, um, so we did that. Uh, so we set up these measurements in, in my lab and uh, we started measuring a few different devices and we were frustrated because these are all results from the same wafer. So we thought normally it should be, we should get the same result and uh, it still seemed to vary and our hypotheses are there could be some inhomogeneous strain relaxation across the wafer. So we made these uh, samples strained so that we could increase this uh, spin orbit field. Um, but maybe the strain is not uniform across the wafer or maybe the ob optical absorption is not uniform, the composition is not uniform, and so that's affecting um, how we're interpreting our results. So, so when you say the same wafer, but these are different pieces of the... There are different pieces of, the, of the, yes. Of the same wafer. And we even tried making a map and, and looking at how this varied, and yeah. it didn't seem like there was a clear trend, unfortunately. Do you have any sense of what the correlation length is over which things change? No, so we, we, I mean, we made devices that were right next to each other. We thought they would be similar, and unfortunately, they're not. So um, we did the best thing we could, um, which is to divide, design a device where um, we can do the optical measurements at the same location. So it's going to be in the center of this crossbar. Um, and uh, you can see there are four contacts. So by uh, changing the ratio of the voltages, um, what we want to do is to change the direction of the electric field that we apply. And the reason for that, of course, is because uh, we know that we have both the Rashba and Dresselhaus fields in our sample. This turns out actually to be the ratio of the Rashba to Dresselhaus fields in one of the samples. And if you add them together, uh, you get this interesting map where you can see that the direction and the magnitude of these internal fields changes dramatically um, with the direction of the electric field. And so, um, yeah, so now we have a way to change the in-plane net drift momentum, uh, K, and we also, uh, my graduate student, um, made, it our, made a special mount for our cryostat so we could rotate it relative to the applied magnetic field direction. So we can actually change the direction the magnetic field is relative to our sample as well. So, um, okay, so this is showing that we can do the same sort of uh, what we call spin drag measurements, looking at the drift of spin packets. Um, as a function of position and voltage, and you see nicely that there's a linear drift uh, velocity, as, as you might hope. Um, along with these measurements, we also fit uh, what the um, spin orbit fields are um, and whether they're along the direction of the magnetic field or perpendicular, so we can get, the, um, we can get both the magnitude and the um, direction uh, of the spin orbit field. And then we repeat this for different directions of the uh, net drift momentum. So we're doing this measurement every 15 degrees in our sample. And so uh, that gives us uh, this slope. And so if we plot the magnitude, which is shown on the left, as a function of direction, and then also the, um, the direction of the internal field relative to the applied field um, here, um, we can see that if we just fit to a linear Dresselhaus plus Rashba, that's where these lines come from. Um, so it's relatively um, agrees well with that. And yeah, the lines only assume that we have linear spin orbit field terms. For that, how do you extract alpha? Do you, how do you know what it is? So we can measure, uh, so, since we know, uh, so alpha and beta, the Rashba and Dresselhaus fields have different direction dependencies. Mm -hmm. So if we, can, if, we, if we can measure this map, we can figure out what uh, they are. And, and I guess one way to think about it too is if you look at the 110 and the 11 bar zero direction, in one direction, uh, the Rashba field is always like circulating, so, but the Dresselhaus field changes direction. So I think it's along, it's, it's like along the Rashba field for 110 and then against it for 11 bar zero. So even if you could measure it just for those two directions, you would, it'd be the sum and difference of your measurements. And that works reasonably well. We, can do, we could do that as well. Yeah, 
That's true, yeah. It looks like there's like a, a, a small like peak uh, for both of these curves. The size of the error bar is the type of the symbol that That's right, right. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So, um, along the way, we also developed a phenomenological model for spin polarization. Um, so, I would really prefer to have a microscopic, like, what is the physics model? But this model at least says, you know, we have a rate equation, we have uh, some uh, spin sc scattering, and it's going to be different um, by little gamma between up spins and down spins. And so uh, we plug that into um, uh, the, you know, this equation that gives us uh, spin precession and uh, spin decay. And we know that the uh, spin decay um, is, uh, for one of the spin relaxation mechanisms, is uh, direction dependent, so it depends on the crystal axes. So this is in a basis that's um, along the 110, 11 bar 0, and 001 crystal axes. And if we work through this, uh, we find that um, the, there will be, so this is the steady state uh, spin polarization, electrically generated spin polarization, and we assume that the spins are polarized along the direction of the spin orbit field, uh, but what we find um, when we work through this is that there'll be some angle of deviation between the steady state spin polarization direction and the direction along with which spins are generated. So this has always been a puzzle for this current induced spin polarization as well, which is why it um, appears to be generated along the direction of the internal field as opposed to the vector sum of the internal field and the applied magnetic field. Um, but that's just the way it seems to behave. Um, and um, so basically what this is telling us is because um, the spin relaxation is anisotropic, we can end up with a sp steady state spin polarization that's not along the direction of spin generation. And um, finally then um, we can get an equation for how this uh, steady state spin polarization with precession uh, depends on, um, well, the external field, so that comes in here, and, and also in the total omega. So, um, yeah, so this expression, uh, if we can test whether it works, um, okay, so this is explaining how um, this deviation angle depends on the anisotropy in the spin lifetime between the two crystal directions. Um, and uh, this inset shows what we measure for the spin lifetime along different crystal directions. So you can see that there is some anisotropy. So it's, there's a longer spin lifetime for 110 than there is for 11 bar zero. So, um, in, so we were excited to, to test this model and show that if we change the direction of the applied field relative to the direction of the spin orbit field, indeed you can use this model to, uh, to fit um, what the signal looks like. Uh, one thing you'll notice is that the signal is larger when the uh, spin orbit field is perpendicular to the applied magnetic field, which is when, it can, when the applied magnetic field can most effectively give you uh, spin precession out of the plane. Uh, which is what we measure. Um, so we do the rest, most of the measurements in that configuration, finding the um, angle where the um, applied magnetic field is large, uh, perpendicular to the spin orbit field. Well, it, but it's not only bigger, it changes character. It also changes character, right. So that, that's because the, um, yeah, it, it also affects what, what these angles are. Okay, so that's all within the model. Yeah, so that's all within the model. So this. Exactly, yeah. So it shows that this phenomenological model is a reasonable description of what happens, um, even if we don't know microscopically what is the physics that causes there to be this effect. So if, if I were to look at that, I haven't quite absorbed the expression, but, but if I look at it, it looks like the dispersive part is just going away as you're changing the angle, and there's a small absorptive part that is left behind. Is that a fair description of what's going on, or is it more it's, I guess. No, I don't think it's more complicated. I, I think it may be a little bit different because what, what we're measuring is, so there's a direction that the spins are produced in the plane. <coughs> Sorry. And then there's the direction of the magnetic field. And if those are parallel, then you won't get spin polar, you won't get spin precession. And so that's, that accounts for the small signal. But when you have the spin polarization produced perpendicular to the, uh, applied magnetic field, then you get maximum spin precession. But again, that kind of goes back to this question of why do the spins polarize along the direction of the spin orbit field and not the total magnetic field? And, that, and, and we don't understand that. <laughs>
But that, that's what it appears to behave like. So, yes? I'm wondering if the model has a change of use that allows for change of use. Because if the model is before, you don't have an applied statistics model, but then later right. on, there are changes to the statistics. So, again, so there could be some special decision on this change. So the, the, so the electric field is, is, so we're doing the measurements in a region of uniform, relatively uniform electric field. And from what we know, the current induced spin polarization is, so if people measure like a rectangular channel where the electric field is uniform throughout the channel, and they, there doesn't seem to be any change in the current induced spin polarization as you move along or across the channel. So, yeah. So I, I, I don't know the mechanism for this electrically generated spin polarization. But your model doesn't assume that there's such a thing. One it, assumes that there's it, it doesn't assume anything except that the, the spin, spins are generated along the direction of the spin orbit field. And that could be due to spin dependent scattering or it could be due to an intrinsic effect. So, so our model is really, like, it's really a, a rate equation and we don't justify where it comes from because we don't know that. So there are... Right. So these are um, kind of an interesting hybrid. So these are strained indium gallium arsenide epilayers. So they're 500 nanometers thick. They're, they're, so it's not a quantum well. Um, and we think that the, actually it's not linear Drussel house, but biaxial strain that dominates the, what we call the Drussel house spin orbit field. It has the same K dependence as the dr linear Drussel house. So when I'm sloppy, and, and there's no way for us to, from our measurements, tell which is which. So um, I just kind of loosely call it Drussel house. Okay. So, okay, so we, we do these measurements um, now along different uh, directions. So these are just plotted for different angles and you can see they increase roughly linearly with um, electric field. Um, we often plot things in terms of the spin drift velocity because um, we're not exactly sure what our contact resistance is, but if we just plot things as a function of spin drift velocity, we don't really have to worry about that. The voltage drop across the contacts. So, um, okay, so this is the slide we were all waiting for. Um, how is this uh, spin orbit splitting related to this electrically generated spin polarization efficiency? And uh, we were surprised to see that it seems to be inversely related, um, which is not what um, any existing theories that we could find would tell us. And um, because we were surprised by this, we did the measurements on another four contact device, which also happened to have a different ratio of Roshba and Drusselhaus spin orbit fields. Um, and it didn't, um, I guess the interesting thing is it showed the same inverse relationship, but it doesn't completely overlap with the other data. So that tells you that, so that told us that there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between the spin orbit splitting and the electrical spin generation efficiency, and, and maybe this ratio also matters, the percentage of Roshba and Dresselhaus. I think one, one challenge is that most theories um, consider just a Roshba spin splitting, and they don't consider both Roshba and Dresselhaus. And so maybe if both of those terms were uh, considered, um, we would maybe be able to find um, a better correspondence. And I guess if we go back to our old data where we saw this, uh, these effects that, that, you know, these different channels that didn't have the same results, um, the, uh, they are, however, consistent with what we see now um, with the, uh, with, where we can do measurements uh, for different angles along the same sample and that they, d they also seem to show this inverse relationship. Okay, so um, at least from our results uh, in, in this material, we, we find that the electrical spin generation efficiency seems to be larger for crystal directions corresponding to smaller spin splitting coefficient. Um, and maybe this, rush, uh, uh, this ratio of alpha and beta is also important. <coughs> okay. So um, I'll now uh, quickly talk about a few other related topics. Um, so um, we're interested also in, in the nuclear spin system. So one of these, one of the reasons we're interested in it was kind of practical, I guess, 
if, if we go back to these electrical spin generation efficiency curves, um, I mean, one, pro one challenge is that in order to measure the spins in our measurements, um, the spin polarization needs to be out of plane. So the, sa the signal is zero at zero external field, and then it becomes large when we apply some non-zero external field. So we wanted to see if we could more closely under, you know, measure something that was uh, corresponded to the um, electron spin polarization in the plane. And uh, we can do that through the nuclear spin system because there is dynamic nuclear uh, polarization that occurs. So if you change the spin temperature of the electron spin system relative to the nuclear spin system, um, you'll uh, polarize, you'll change the polarization of the nuclear spins uh, through the contact hyperfine interaction. And then uh, once you have some nuclear spin polarization, that also acts on the electron spins as an effective magnetic field, um, which you may also know as the Overhauser effect. And then again, um, like this picture, we can do our measurements of the electron spin system to learn something about the polarization of the nuclear spin system. So uh, the picture for this is that we start off with our semiconductor sample, which in equilibrium has no net spin polarization, either electron nor nuclear. And then we apply our voltage, and this current-induced spin polarization effect causes the electrons to polarize really quickly. So time-resolved measurements has shown that happens on a picosecond time scale. But the nuclear spin polarization will then occur over a time scale of minutes. That's the T1E time of the nuclear spins. And so if we model what we expect to happen um, as we apply a voltage to our sample, um, we get this quick jump uh, due to the spin orbit field um, that the electrons see that I've talked about earlier. And then there should be a buildup of um, a change in the effective uh, magnetic field, internal magnetic field due to the nuclear spin. And indeed, when we do these measurements, this is what we observe. And so we can then fit this data to determine the T1E time uh, for the nuclear spins and also the magnitude of this nuclear spin polarization. So these measurements, uh, we do these measurements using what we call optical Larmor magnetometry. Um, but it's really the same time-resolved optical technique that I talked about before. Um, we're just spinning, uh, fitting the electron spin precession frequency to determine the overall magnetic field experienced by the spins. And that will consist of the applied magnetic field plus the spin orbit field plus the nuclear field. And so we optimized this so that we could do a delay scan in 40 seconds, and it has a measurement error of about plus or minus 50 microtesla. And so now this is a color plot showing what happens as a function of lab time for a couple of voltage switches. So you can see a clear change in the precession, um, where the positions of those peaks, uh, which we can then fit and uh, show that um, if we change the direction of the current, we can either polarize the nuclear spins so that they add to the applied field or they subtract from the applied field. So we're either polarizing them with or against the applied magnetic field, which is kind of neat. Um, so how do we know that what we're doing is not just heating the electron spin bath? Uh, so this, this, direction, uh, this um, effect has a strong direction dependence. So it requires that the electrically generated spins be um, parallel along the direction of the uh, magnetic field. Um, so if you do the measurement with this, uh, these currents oriented so that the electrically generated spins are perpendicular to the magnetic field, you see a, a you know, less of an effect. So uh, if this was heating, the direction of the current uh, would not matter. And um, we also, this also shows that you can then use this to polarize the nuclear spins either along, along with or against the applied magnetic field. So um, I guess another topic that we um, recently worked on um, was studying the effects of an in-plane electric field on the electron g-factor. So th this might be interesting if you wanted to tune um, this electron spin precession frequency. So this has been done in quantum wells, both with the top gate. So this showed the effects of changing the position of the electric electron wave function relative to the barriers. And because the g-factor depends on the material um, it also changes the g-factor quite dramatically. Um, this is actually um, more work from John Solis's group now at IBM Zurich, uh, where they did measurements in, an, in a quantum well, but this time with an in-plane electric field or current, and showed that the g-factor also um, had some dependence on the current as well. So we wanted to see whether we could see this in our bulk up layers. And so um, already we had this data because we were measuring um, the... Um, doing our spin drag measurements, except we weren't looking very closely at the fit parameters of the g-factor, uh, but we can do that. And when we did that, uh, we found indeed that there was some dependence of the g uh, 
factor on, on drift velocity. So we think this is some effect of um, heating the electron, uh, yeah, of changing the electron temperature. Um, okay, so I guess in the last few minutes, I'll, I'll talk about um, spin no noise spectroscopy. So our optical pump probe techniques are great. Um, I enjoy using them a lot, um, but they require optical pumping. And whether we like it or not, this optical pump pulse is perturbing our system. It's creating spin polarization, which we like. It, it also could be heating um, the electron temperature, which, which we might not like. And it also requires you know, a, a relatively large spin polarization so that we can measure it. Um, so um, what if you could measure the same dynamics without optical pumping? It would allow you to access what's happening closer to equilibrium. So um, this has been done um, uh, by some groups. Um, and uh, I, I like this cartoon because it shows um, basically the idea of this measurement. So you can just take a laser diode and um, you're, you're no longer optically pumping the system, but you're just measuring the Faraday rotation that's produced by stochastic spin polarization. So just the randomly produced spin polarization over time. And so you can detect that spin polarization. And then if you uh, analyze its frequency dependence, um, what happens is they were able to measure a peak at the uh, spin precession frequency. And so if you can do that, uh, that tells, and you, if you can fit this, um, this can tell you both uh, something about the electron G factor, because that determines the slope of how the <laughs> frequency depends on magnetic field. And you can also uh, measure from the width of this peak uh, the spin lifetime. Um, a couple of challenges with this measurement, though, is that you can only sample the data um, so quickly and with so much uh, resolution. Um, so um, that limits the, the, this frequency bandwidth which, which you can do these measurements. So to get to um, measure things that happen at faster time scales, uh, we can then um, go back to using ultra-fast optical techniques. And um, th this has also been done uh, by a group in Germany, uh, the idea of an ultra-fast spin noise spectroscopy. And the idea here is to send two probe pulses uh, through the sample. And again, um, but this time to measure a term that's related to the product of their signals. And that allows you to measure the correlation um, of those two measurements. And if you ch can change the time delay between those two pulses, you'll map out the, the correlation function in the, in the time domain. So in these measurements, they um, digitized the signal and then did this calculation. Uh, we came up with a way in our lab uh, to do it using analog electronics. And uh, I guess I didn't know how much time I had, so I um, didn't show very much about this technique. Um, but it, indeed, we can show that we can map out in the time domain this correlation function and, and measure uh, the spin precession frequency and lifetime um, in a way that's the same as what you could do with um, pump probe techniques. Um, the signals are a lot smaller because we're just measuring the intrinsic fluctuations. These are really tiny spin polarizations. Um, and then another thing uh, we, we did is uh, we also did measurements now at a fixed probe-probe uh, time delay. As, as a function of magnetic field. And what you would expect is just this, these cosinusoidal oscillations. Uh, what we saw instead that really puzzles us for a while were, were these sharp peaks, um, but we quickly understood that where those arose from is uh, we're sending in, again, we're using a mode lock laser. It's producing pulses every 13 nanoseconds. So we're measuring not just the correlations between pulses that are separated by two nanoseconds, but also the correlations of pulses uh, separated by 13 nanoseconds, 15, et cetera. And when those sum together, you end up with these sharp peaks. That turns out to be actually an interesting feature because uh, using this, this method of time resolved spin noise, you can imagine that your, um, the, the signals you can measure are kind of limited by your delay range um, or ultimately then by your laser repetition period, which is only 13 nanoseconds. It turns out because we can measure all these additional correlations and then we can do a fit to see how those, how that sum, you know, how, what those different terms in that sum are, uh, we can actually access much longer spin lifetimes with our measurements. And so we can measure spin lifetimes that are like 30 nanoseconds lo longer than our laser repetition period with no problem. So, okay. And so it's uh, consistent with pump probe measurements, but it allows us to measure things without optical pumping. Okay, so um, that's the end of my talk. I'll briefly just 
overview of what I talked about. Uh, so we, we first talked about electrically generated spin polarization and how we found unexpectedly that it was larger for directions corresponding to smaller spin orbits field. We then showed how that electrically generated spin polarization could produce a nuclear spin polarization and also how uh, the electron G factor can change with an in-plane current. And um, well, this is an effect that hasn't been pointed out, but it's important to take into account uh, because uh, if you're doing like an electron spin resonance or a time resolved Faraday rotation measurement to measure the spin orbit field, you should take into account how the G factor changes as well. And now we know it changes with electric field as well. And uh, finally, I showed you our results of uh, spin noise spectroscopy and how we could use a resonance spin noise technique to measure spin lifetimes that exceed the laser repetition period. <laughs>